I think that song was a message in itself, and uh, I just praise God for that song. And uh, so I don't think we still have, no, nope, we don't have the screens up yet. And uh, so we'll just go with without the screens. And, uh, but yeah, today's message is called A Call for World Changers. Does the world need world changers? There's a lot of people trying to change the world. All kinds of people trying to change the world. There's people that uh, get together in uh, even a big group uh, called the WEF and all kinds of different groups. They get together and they, they try to plan out on how to change the world. And they have their agendas. And then they actually put their agendas into a plan. And they lay it all out. And a lot of times, these agendas get even revealed in really unique ways to the world. They tell the world what their plans are ahead of time through very creative ways. And I don't know if you guys um, uh, have ever saw how the even the cartoon The Simpsons seem to predict the future, right? There's some very, inch, and as weird as that sounds, the correlations are so uncanny, it's hard to believe that they aren't, whoever is using things like that to kind of project out to the world in subtle ways the plans that they are making to change the world. So, are all of the plans for, that all the people have in the world the best plans for the world? If they've got, if all these people are, have all these plans to change the world and they feel that they're the best plans, the best plans for who? And let me ask you, what's the standard that they're going off of to change the world? What's their goal? Things that make me go, hmm. What needs to be done, they ponder, to get to that point. And you've probably heard, and some of you are military, um, uh, and I appreciate so much of every single one of you that served our country in the military, and it's just, just incredible. You know, there's something called, and this is a sad thing to even be able to have to say, but collateral damage. There's stuff that happens that just happens, and it's collateral damage. It's, it's stuff that, that it shouldn't happen, but it does happen, and, and you just, they understand that it's going to happen, and that's part of what it takes to change the world and accomplish the goals, the missions, Who will benefit from this new world that's going to be changed into whatever they anticipate? Who will suffer in the process of the world changing into this agenda that they anticipate? Will anybody suffer as a result of the end of all this? There's going to be a lot of suffering. And the world, whether you like it or not, is changing drastically. 
And I don't know if it's changing the way you want it to change. We're not. But Jesus predicted that this change was going to happen. And in his Bible, we just have been blessed, right, with an opportunity to have this book, and it tells what's going to happen. And you know, that's good news. But Jesus said, as in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall the what times be? The end times be. The end times, right? The end times. Not in our times, but the end times. Way down the road, sometime in the end times. Right? Isn't that what we've always thought? I've always thought that. The end times. A long time from now, probably after I'm dead and gone, after I've lived a long life and, and hopefully a good life and amongst challenges and stuff, but and then someday I'll be resurrected and when Jesus comes, after all those end time events. But I think a lot of you are realizing that we are. We are deadheading right into around the corner, which we're not to know the day or the hour, right, when Jesus busts through those clouds. But the Bible says, Jesus said, we will know when he's what? Near. Very near. How near? Even at the door. That's close. That's extremely close. When you got somebody coming to your house and you're anticipating and, boy, you're not quite ready and whipping up things and getting everything in order and, and, and all of a sudden they text you and say, we're uh, a few miles out. Stress. Oh, man. And you're getting things going there. And then all of a sudden they pull up the drive when you see the headlights or whatever. And you're just like, Ugh! but you still got a little bit of time. Just a little bit of time. Shove that in the closet, whatever. And, <laughs> and then, but when they're at the door, knocking at your door, you're out of time. There's no more anything else. All you can do at that point is open the door as you wipe the sweat off your brow and you put on that big smile and you say, Hey, it's good to have you here. Have you ever done that? No. As in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and Noah's day, Jesus said, will be the end times. <laughs> We're not going to take a trip back to Noah's day right now. I almost wish we could. Just, um, I don't know if you, anybody of you saw when our kids were young, there was a little cartoon animated little show is called The Big House or something like this. And, and it was these kids that would uh, get in this house, and it, the flying house or something, and it, it would fly back to a certain point in the Bible, of a Bible story, and then they'd walk out of the house and they'd get to go and walk out and, and experience that. If we could take, if God could take this house of his and take us back to Noah's day, and then we could just, okay, everybody get on up and, and walk on out and Go check out what it's like in Noah's day. You might not want to spend too much time out there. You might feel a lot comfort, more comfortable coming right back in. And everybody sits back out and I say, Oh, why aren't you guys out there? Uh, yeah, yeah. When's the house go back? You might want to come back really quick. Noah's day was so bad that the Bible said that God repented that he even made man. I wish I hadn't even made them. They're so horrible. They're just, just tearing each other up and just, I wish I hadn't even made them. And he enacted a plan. A long time later, Sodom and Gomorrah 
Would you like God to take this house of his and take it back to Sodom and Gomorrah's and plop it right down in the middle of the city and invite us to walk out of the church of his into Sodom and Gomorrah? I don't want that. That is one of the most challenging stories in my reading of the Bible. So, Jesus said it's going to get really bad. Some would say, oh, Noah's day. Oh, Sodom and Gomorrah's day. Actually, they were pretty right on track with our agenda. Yeah, that's all right. Let's go. Let's be like that. Others would say, uh-uh. That's the wrong direction. I don't know where you're at on that. But depending on your compass will, I believe, determine that. Just recently, my wife and I, we were decided last Saturday evening, Sabbath evening, because she is married to a, I don't know how to describe myself, but a very eccentric um, impromptu, uh, just, I don't know, opportunist, I don't know, decided just, let's go biking down a nice little trail in Nashtamo called the El Sabo Trail. I've been there, I think, once on a mountain bike with a friend, and we got lost then. And we, anyway, short story, we got lost, and it was sundown, and it was dark then and then we were in the deep of the woods and we didn't have it on the GPS uh, tracking us and stuff and so here we are in the pitch black and I had brought a headlamp in my pack and so she had the headlamp I had my cell phone hanging on to it while I'm riding with as a light and we were literally lost the little markers they had markers but they and they had a nice map But nowhere on the map when you came to it, which was very few and far between, did they say, you are here. There was none of that. They had on the map, nice little one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or whatever it was. But nowhere did you find a number at any of the little crossroads. They had nice little arrows, but no numbers. Ah, I'm a systems guy. I like systems and order and uh, boy. And I, anyways, I was challenged and I was praying. And when you're on a Saturday night and yeah, I had bug spray in my backpack and different things and could we have survived the night? Yes, with God's help and stuff. But boy, I didn't want to spend the night out there. And I prayed, and it sunk in pretty deep. We are lost. And then in the middle of all that, we think we're going down, and all of a sudden we get to a point where I know we're going right east, and we're going to hit a little paved pathway by a road, and we'll just take that paved pathway right back to the, the parking lot and come right into a barrier that said, homeowner's property, do not pass. You've got to be kidding me. This is, and I was very challenged with that because I, I was determined to go that way, but I want to be respectful. Anyways, I turned around, I couldn't believe it, and went back into the depth of the forest with my wife. And then we came across, actually my wife yelled up ahead and she goes, honey, where are you? And I yelled, because I'm facing this way, I yelled back, right here. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice up ahead of me. Who's there? I'm like, huh. It was pretty crazy. And I got to shorten the story up. But we, a young lady and a young man, and they're walking through the woods in the middle of the night. And not a good situation, in my opinion. But... She supposedly knew where we were and every. She said, I think you need to go that way. I said, thank you so much. And we start riding that way. And immediately, I get this conviction as I'm praying, going the wrong way. I didn't know where we were. 
But I got impressed as I was praying, we're going the wrong way. And I stopped, I took my backpack off, I got my little compass out. Oh, we're back to the sermon. Got my compass out. And I looked at the compass, and we're going the wrong way. Wow. To have a compass in those situations is almost priceless. Especially when it's dark, and you can't see the sun, and the direction it's going, and all that stuff. And, and so we turned around and went the other direction, and thank you, Lord, again, we made it out to the Jeep. It was a beautiful thing. The Jeep Dever looked so good. <laughs> compass, agenda compass, or there's another compass, a moral compass. You know, how do you get a moral compass? to direct us to have morals versus the inverse of that would be immorality-ish. And I love that God has given us this compass to lead us to his agenda and his truths and his paths. And so I, I just love learning from God's word about this. Can you live in a world and even um, a close environment with people of different worldviews, beliefs, and directions? You can. It's not going to be ideal. It's going to be challenging. I'm just glad that God says that someday, whether you think the, boy, I don't know if I can be in heaven if that person's going to be there or that person's going to be there, have you ever heard anybody say that? Hopefully you haven't said that, but, but we maybe have thought of it and whatever. Maybe we've th said it. You know, God's going to bring us into unity with him at that time. He's going to be working in us, and I just am longing to just let God just change me. And uh, so behind the scenes of this world, whether whoever's in the presidency and whoever's overseas is a president of Russia and all this, that, and the other thing, no matter who is quote-unquote in charge, there's actually, according to God's word, there's two superpowers that are actually in charge. One is completely in charge. The other one's temporarily in charge or, or thinks he has in charge. And he's trying his best to create the world into what he thinks it should be. And so we got God the Father and Jesus. And then we got Satan and all his cronies. And both have agendas. And both have worldviews. Both are trying really hard to make things come about their way. One, Satan is, and his cronies are willing to have uh, just do whatever it takes, but they don't want to die. The other one is willing to do whatever it takes, including even dying. And he did. And he laid down his life for us while we were yet sinners so that we could have eternal life. So between the two, I've committed to Jesus Christ and committed my life to serve him and help him or him work through me to accomplish his purposes on this planet. I want to be a game changer, a world changer for Jesus Christ. I really do. And you know, this world, this Bible, it has a lot of world changers in it. You've read about them. Abraham, was he a world changer back in his day? Absolutely. When God invited him to just 
go? Just pack up and go to a place that I'll show you? What did he do? Packed up. And I guarantee you, he had a lot of resistance. When you start going in God's direction where he's convicting you of going, you're going to have people that actually resist you, possibly in your own family. This is an opportunity for us to be praying, not forcing them, praying for them. I mean, you got people like Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Daniel, Esther, Nehemiah, Mary and Joseph, the disciples. There are so many game changers in this book, so many world changers in this book. And God is still looking for world changers today. Those people, pretty much all of them, they're lying in the graves awaiting Jesus' second coming. They're not still here and active anymore. You got an exception. I got to say in the Moses, the Bible says God took him. Well, exceptions, but that's up to God. Most of them. God's world changers, though they always stay true to him and his agenda, get this, despite what happens to them or their circumstances. God's world changers always stay true to him and his agenda despite what happens to them or their circumstances. I want to take you in your Bibles, if you want to go with me, to one of my favorite world changers. And we're going to go all the way to Genesis. In Genesis 39, and in the youth Sabbath school, we uh, actually talked about this young man in a very interesting way. And uh, maybe if you want, if you're so in, in, uh, inquisitive, ask him what possibly was his favorite food. And they'll tell you, <laughs> Allie and Emma are pretty laughing right now because uh, we got pretty creative talking about possibly Joseph's, one of his favorite foods. But in Genesis 39, we don't have time to really dive deep, deep, deep. And there is so much to draw out of this story, so much. And I love, Doug Batchelor did a, a whole correlation showing the correlation of Joseph as, um, what do you call that, example-like um, uh, similitude of, of Jesus' life. It is so impressive what's in this story of Joseph. It's like a zipped computer file and the more you unzip it and unzip it, it's just there's so, still tons more and tons more. We're going to just kind of uh, do a, a flyover, if you will. We're going to just kind of buzz the tower here. And it, in verse uh, 1 of 39, I just want to focus on Joseph as a world changer. And in this case, it was his world. Keep in mind, before we even dive in on that, Joseph was born into a really pretty rough, challenging family situation, right? He had a, a dad who had two wives, which is, uh, there's a reason why God says that's not good. And uh, the one wife had sons and everything, and then the uh, his other wife couldn't have kids until finally, later on, she had a child, and then out comes Joseph. And wow, we've got a boy. We have a boy. Well, the other wife is like, whatever, 
I got a bunch of sons. Uh, you got one. Uh, oh, it was just tension. Oh, not good. Doing it God's way is the best way. So, bringing other people into your marriage is not a good thing. But we won't get into that too deep. But, so here Joseph, now he's this only child to that mother with that father. And, and uh, boy, he's a special guy. And he's treated kind of special. He even gets special clothes and everything. Oh, he's special. Well, that doesn't make the other brothers of the other wife very happy. And there's jealousy and all kinds of stuff and anger and it, tensions. And, ah. and before you know it, Joseph finds himself walking on out after his studies, and he was a very learned man, very educated man, and he finds himself walking on out to go see how his brothers are doing out in the fields and stuff, and they didn't receive him well, and they got, man, what are we going to do with this guy? And they decided, you know what, we don't know what to do with this guy, so they grabbed hold of him, and they threw him in a, well, they took his coat off of him, threw him in a pit, and said, stay there until we figure out what to do with you. And sure enough, about that same time, here comes some not-so-nice caravan of people, the Ishmaelites. Doesn't that just, that just doesn't sound very like a friendly group, the Ishmaelites. They're probably really nice people today if they're still, I don't know. And so they're marching along, and here they come with their camels in this caravan, and Maybe I'm picturing, I'm, I'm hearing like uh, bells or something on the camels as they're swaying and ting, 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 and they're, they're, I don't know. And all of a sudden, Joseph's brothers say, hey, boys, I got an idea. What if we just off Joseph to them? Pocket a little cash. We're rid of him and we're wealthier doing it. Okay, and they agree to this plot. They drag him out, out of there. They sell him to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites drag him behind a camel, I'm imagining, and here he is chained to the back of a camel, and that just doesn't seem like a pretty place to just kind of wander behind. And he, and he finally gets to where? Egypt. And he's looking at this big city and he's, he's walking along and before you know it, he's up on a platform and he doesn't know what he's being done there. And before you know it, people start bidding and bidding and bidding. And before you know it, he's a very intelligent young man and he realizes what's going on. They're bidding to buy me as a slave. And maybe right beside him is lined up all these other slaves that are probably beaten and saw all these scars and everything. And, and here he is looking all purdy because he's a purdy boy, pampered. And before somebody, and I guarantee Satan was going to try to take this world changer out in a quick hurry and have him get bought by somebody that was just going to beat him to death, literally. Stomp him out. Because God had shown this boy, I've got plans for you. Huge plans to change the world. And Satan tried to take out those plans. But the ultimate one that's in control of this world and this universe is God the Father. And sure enough, he aligned it just like miraculous, like he can do. For this man Potiphar, captain of the guard, to come along right at that time. Possibly had to do a detour and was frustrated about that. And it led him along this alley, which he probably didn't really care for. Because I think he had a heart. I really do. I really believe we're going to see Potiphar in heaven. I believe Joseph changed this, helped change this man's heart and turn him to the true God. And I believe that was one of the reasons why God took him there. So this man, he sees Joseph, this clean, nice, wow, pampered little boy up there on the platform, and he's like, wow. And I believe God put it in his heart by that young man. And he stopped, 
And all of a sudden, in the middle of uh, the auctioneering, da, 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 20, 30, 40, do I have a 50, da, 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 all of a sudden, I don't know. I believe this man was a get her done kind of guy. And he just dropped the hammer and just said, thousand dollars. And everybody's like, oh, I'm out. There, he wasn't, I, check me if I'm wrong or right, I don't know. Someday we're gonna learn. But he wasn't in negotiation, I don't believe. God put it on his heart, he bought the man. He took him to be what? A son? No, a slave. And he put him at a task. And this is where we pick up the story in Genesis 39. Verse 1 says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which he had brought him down thither. And get this, verse 2, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, was Joseph a world changer? Why? Verse 2 says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Wait a minute. It says that he was a prosperous man. When you picture in your mind a slave... Do you picture that slave as a prosperous man? Do you picture that woman slave as a prosperous woman? I don't. But the Bible says that, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and verse 3 says, and his master ob Picture his master, he's observing Joseph, and it says that his master saw something in Joseph. What did the master see in Joseph? That the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. I'm telling you, if we're going to be world changers, that's one of the lowest common denominators that's the the foundation that we need to have is for the lord to be with us because if if what's that verse say if god is for us who can be against us so we need to have the lord with us well the lord was with joseph and, and his master saw that. And the Lord, and then finished in that verse 3, says, and, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Every single thing that Joseph did or touched prospered. Joseph? Yes, sir. I'd like you to wash that floor of the, the auditorium for me, please. Yes, sir. It'll be done. And he watched him, maybe through a little corner of the window, looking out over that, and he watched him. And maybe when Joseph got to a, a really dirty spot, that could it be that Potiphar even put a stain on that floor that was almost impossible to get out. And could it be that Potiphar looked out and watched him and what? Ooh, he's getting closer. He's getting closer to that. And he watched Joseph possibly, I don't know, this is just hypothetical, but this is the character of Joseph. He got to that stain and all of a sudden, Potiphar watched as he waxed harder and harder and harder and harder. And sometimes, what do you need that kind of grease? I, what is that to get things really out of things? Elbow grease. 
He put more and more elbow grease into that thing, and he rubbed and rubbed and rubbed, and he scrubbed his, and then he went, and he thought, oh, yep, there he goes, he's giving up. And he comes back with something else, and he rubs and scrubs and scrubs and scrubs. Maybe he didn't, and he goes away. Oh, now he's done. Yeah, I know, he's gave up now. And he comes back, and he scrubs and scrubs and scrubs. And scrubs. Before you know it, he moves on. Hmm, I wonder. Probably couldn't get it out. Guarantee he couldn't get that out. I've never been able to get that out. None of my servants have ever been able to get that out. Huh. And he watches him finish the whole thing and then retire. Maybe it's late at night. Potiphar goes on out and walks right over where that stain was with his lantern and, and looks and there's nothing there but a shiny spot. Hmm. Hmm. Before you know it, Potiphar says, Joseph, I've got something for you to do. Yes, sir. I want you to go da da. I want you to take care of my horses. I want you to take care of this. I want you to take care of this. Yes, sir. It'll be done. And he watched and he watched. And I don't know about you guys, I got goosebumps under this jacket. And he saw that every single thing that Joseph did prospered. And what would a wise man do? Just what Potiphar did. He put him in charge of everything he had. The Bible goes on to say that. And verse uh, 4, And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, served him. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed what? What did the Lord bless? The Egyptian's house. Wow. Was Joseph a world changer? His world. Absolutely he was. And it came to pass from that time that he had made, in verse 5, made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Mm. Wow. One of my favorite stories. Right here is when I usually say, I want to be Joseph, I want to be like Joseph, and I do. I want to be like Joseph. But even more than wanting to be like Joseph is I want to be like Jesus. But we can't be Jesus, but we can be like Joseph and let Jesus live his life out through us. And as Jesus lives his life out through us, Jesus then uses us as his hands and feet to do things, to be a blessing to everybody around us. And now, all of a sudden, our whole families are blessed. The church family is blessed. The gas station attendant lady is blessed. On and on and on it goes. Because the Lord was with Jason. The Lord was with Elizabeth. The Lord was with Eric, the Lord was with Tommy. The Lord was, put your name there. World changers. And then it continues. And number six says, and he left all that he had, Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. Wow. Sadly, the story doesn't end there about Joseph. He, uh, Potiphar's wife took a liking to him and, and uh, he refused to be, be drawn down into her level and 
to sleep with her. And I want to say that he said, says right here, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said to lie with her, and he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, what is not um, uh, what is with me in his house? And he had committed all that he has to my hand. There is none greater in his house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou, thou art his wife. You don't mess with people's wives. Is that seem too basic? But that's what God's word says. You don't mess with people's husbands. And then um, uh, he says, There's none greater than I, neither has he kept back anything except for thee, because thou art his wife. And then here's the here is the commitment of Joseph to his God. How then can I do this great wickedness? Come on, let's call sin by its real name. You take somebody's wife, that's wickedness. Take somebody's husband, that's wickedness. How can I do that? You, you go and be with somebody that's not your wife, that's wickedness. If you got, yeah. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against who? Potiphar? God. This is another foundation. Joseph understood this. We are ultimately accountable to who? God. This is why we do things. This is who we live for. We live to serve God and to let him come into our lives, to live his life out through us so that we can, so that he can change the world through us. All for his honor and glory. As we wrap right up here, got a few takeaways. Wish you could see on the screen. Well, probably could see him on the screen, but I won't take the time to plug it in. Good job, AV team back there. Got those screens going. Takeaways from Joseph. He learned about God, right? But that's not enough. You can have all the head knowledge about God. You can read this cover to cover. You can know scripture, Bible, pictionary, scriptionary, whatever. You can answer every single question before anybody else, and everybody can go, wow. You sure know a lot about the Bible and God. But wait, he learned about God, but then he had a personal dedication to God and his truths. Number three, he relied on God to give him the will and the to-do of his good pleasure. Whose good pleasure? God's. Number four, in every task, big or small, he learned to do it not unto his master first, but unto the Lord. Do it unto the Lord. And all you young people out there, I want to challenge you guys. When mom and dad ask you to take out the trash, Allie and Emma and Jaden and all you, when, God, when parents ask you to do something, do it unto God. First and foremost, make God proud of you. When he looks down and God sees you doing whatever you're doing, you're doing it unto God. And all of us, we're all young people in eternity's standpoint. And number five, in due season, when God knew that Joseph was ready, then God lifted him up. Well, Joseph ended up going down into getting put into a prison for years. But even in the prison... Joseph was faithful to God, number one, kept a great attitude because he had hope 
in God, hopelessness will get you down to the depths of despair and make you miserable. Don't have, don't get in that. We have a hope. Our God is going to prevail. And whether it's while we're in the dungeon or where, if we're in the palace, someday Jesus is going to bust through those clouds and he's going to take us to places that are way beyond the palaces that we've seen here. So we just got to, wherever we are, we've got to just honor him and do the best while we're there. And Joseph did that. And he became a leader in the prison. Really? Until God lifted him up out of there and put him second command of all of Egypt. Because why? Because there was a famine coming. There was a famine coming. And God gave a vision to that Egyptian pharaoh. And he didn't know what it was. But God used Joseph to interpret that and to tell him there's seven years of plenty right on the way. We're going to be living large. But following this, there's seven years of famine like we've never seen before and tons of people and animals and beasts are going to die. And Pharaoh's like, whoa! Whoa! That's scary. That's exactly, that matches my dreams. What do we do about it? And Joseph didn't just, well, let me think about that. I'll, I'll come up with a good plan. I'm a smart man. And No, I believe God immediately put it on his heart because he was that in tune with God. And the Holy Spirit just came upon Sure enough, Joseph said, here's the plan. And he laid out a plan. And Pharaoh said, that's a good plan. I want that done. And you know what? Who am I going to put over this plan? I want you. Nobody but you heading up that plan. I'm putting you second in command to all of Egypt. God rose him up to be a world changer to change people's lives and save people's lives. And I'm just going to challenge you guys. I don't know if you guys have kept your heads in the sands or if you're watching anything that's going on, but if you haven't heard about even people talking about a drought and a famine's coming in the world today, it's out there like crazy. world changers God needs world changers people submitted to him completely submitted to him and saying Lord what would you have me to do in such a time as this as we're right now in a plentiful time but we know through your scriptures things are going to change and it's going to get extremely bad I'm telling you I want to be one of those world changers. Closing up here, he says, um, uh, another item here, when evil temptations came to Joseph, he wouldn't do it because he wouldn't dishonor his God. He could not do that thing against his God. And he ran away. When evil comes, and it does for each one of us, evil temptations come to each and every one of us. Every day, they're coming to us, whether it's right in your face or it's in your mind. Temptations are coming to us equal to Joseph's temptation. We have got to say, how can I sin against God and run away in his strength oh, man and uh, the last one here was saying um, uh, he looked for all the ways God had for him to be a blessing to others despite his current situation or circumstances no matter your current situation or circumstances ask God how would you make me 
and to be a blessing to others even in this situation. And then let God be God and work through you to be a world changer. And it comes by simply surrendering our lives to him, completely, unreservedly, surrendering our, our plans. I'm sure you guys have plans. I got lots of plans. Dreams. You kind of have an idea of how your life's going to play out. It comes by surrendering all that to Jesus and saying, I'm yours. My kids, my marriage, my whatever applies to you, my job, my vehicle, my home, my everything is yours. Use it all to change the world however you see fit and to change my world where you've put me for such a time as this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, here we are. You brought us here. I want to praise you for what you've been doing in our lives. I praise you for bringing us here for such a time as this. I want to praise you for this story again of your servant, Joseph. We're looking forward to meeting him, talking with him, someday throughout eternity. But first and foremost, we're looking forward to seeing you face to face. Oh, but Lord, before you show yourself to us in those clouds, a lot's going to happen, and you've laid it out in your scriptures. It's going to get rough. It's going to get bumpy. The temptations are going to bombard us, try to destroy us. Lord, we need you more than we possibly could ever imagine. We've failed you so much. Right now, I want to give each and every one of us opportunity silently to just say, Lord, I'm sorry for failing you in the past. I'm sorry for not doing what you, in, you encouraged me to do. I'm sorry for, for doing what you impressed me not to do. I'm sorry, Lord, for having a sour attitude for my situations in the past or even right now in my life. Feeling all mopey. Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, right here and right now of all our unrighteousness. Cleanse us, Lord. Fill us now with you and your Holy Spirit and empower, equip, and enable each and every one of us to accomplish your will in our lives and be world changers for you. Thank you. I love you, Lord. Protect us, please, from evil. Protect us, Lord. Put hedges of protection around all that we have, even our dreams and plans. Prepare us for the times ahead whatever that takes. Put smiles on our faces, joy in our hearts, as we willingly, from this day forward, serve you with all of our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to 